Uh, let me see how this works first. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Everyone, um, good to see you again. I had the pleasure last night of uh, having some great conversations over over a glass of water and some some food. It was uh, very pleasant to uh, see that I, I relinked with, with some old acquaintances uh, back in the U.S. and uh, met some new ones. Um, so here we are today in Toulouse. Beautiful weather. Um, I'd like to first apologize for John uh, for not being here. As Stefan said yesterday, he's off doing what he does best, which is uh, selling airplanes. But he was generous enough to uh, leave me the opportunity to fill his shoes. So I will do the best that I can uh, to uh, hopefully make this informative and, and along the way possibly uh, entertaining. So with that, what a great start into 2013. Uh, 517 new orders, 247 deliveries, well on a good path for the end of the year. With a backlog that is strengthening and taking us into the future, well distributed over our products. And you can see that with uh, just about 5,000 uh, orders in our backlog. When you look at our backlog over the regions, well, well distributed over the regions, and I think I don't see it here. Well distributed over the regions and clearly representing where the growth centers are. Um, when you look at the deliveries in 2012, also consistent around the, uh, around the globe. And that will continue on into 2013 uh, with the exception of North America, where what you see occurring in North America today is the effect of the, uh, of the replacement waves, so the retirement of an older aircraft in North America. So strong start in 2013. Asia Pacific well represented in our backlog, very much representing where some of the major growth centers uh, will be in the future. And of course in North America, the replacement cycle begins. Let me spend a couple of minutes and talk about the state of the industry. And I'd also like to talk about what Airbus can do to, to assist uh, this industry in the future, our solutions and, and how we look at, uh, at our products. You're all familiar with this chart, and uh, it's a chart that uh, uh, when I started in Airbus three years ago, three and a half years ago, was really drilled into me. This industry is resilient. Um, it, has, uh, it has weathered through many crises over the last years. And what was very important to, to take away was the rebound that occurred after a crisis. And so this was a, a very strong message we used, especially since about five years we've been in a recession. And there's nothing better than looking at the positive news of hopefully one day when we're coming out of, out of the recession that, that there, is, there is growth opportunities there. But during those last five years, the industry was quite cautious. It was quite cautious in the way that it managed its capacity. Clearly there was a mindset, and the mindset was there's a risk of filling the seats if I have the seats. So naturally what happened was the industry took capacity out. They took seats out of the industry, they parked aircraft, they, they, they slowed down in, in the ordering of, of the type of aircraft that they were, uh, the larger capacity aircraft, and they were waiting to see what would occur. When would we come out of, of, this, uh, of this financial crisis? As a result of this capacity uh, contraction, naturally what, hap what happened was load factors peaked we've seen the highest load factors in the industry. So that tells you that the industry was cautious, cautiously optimistic. Traffic was still there. We had, we had contraction in some of the advanced uh, economies, but in the emerging, there was still some traffic growth. And that led to these high load factors. But the, low, the high load factors have a limitation. And the limitation, you can see, it's you get to a limit where you have to look at how do you bring capacity back into the industry, okay? And especially when we look at where this growth is coming from. If we just took a look in 2012, and you looked at uh, the traffic flows in 2012, roughly about one billion people in the, in the mature aviation economies, uh, Western Europe, North America, and Japan, represented over 50% of the traffic. That left the remaining almost 50% of the traffic with the 6 billion in the emerging aviation economies. 6 billion passengers, really, you think about the untapped potential there. When you think about capacity and you think about where this industry is going to grow, 
you look towards the six billion. And that's confirmed when we put all of this together in our 20 year forecast, you've all seen this. Traffic will double again in 15 years and it grows at an annual rate of 4.7%. If we look at where the growths are coming from, again, looking at where the populations are centered, it is clear that the growth will come from Asia Pacific, the Middle East, Latin America, India, those will be the drivers for the growth in the future. When, when you think about those economies and how they will grow, they grow also in trade, they grow in where the people, diaspora, where the people are residing. And because of the, the distances between those centers, and I'm talking the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, to a lesser degree Africa, you can see that long haul traffic will naturally grow faster than short haul traffic. Because you will, those economies will start to connect. So to date, we've seen that long haul traffic has grown faster than short haul traffic. And we'll continue to see that over the next 20 years. Another way of looking at that is if you look at the population centers around the world. You've all seen this. You're all very familiar with this. This is what we call our aviation megacity map. And this represents aviation megacities where more than 10,000 long haul passengers tra travel through a particular airport. Today we have 42 of these such a aviation megacities where 90% of the long haul traffic travel to, from, or via these aviation megacities. In less than 10 years, this will grow to 67 aviation megacities, where about 95% of the long haul traffic will travel through these, through to or from these uh, aviation megacities. And in Asia Pacific, you'll see eight additional aviation megacities, which is pretty consistent with what we see happening today. What's interesting is if we overlay the existing in operation of the A380 today, you can see that the A380 today is already covering a majority of these 42 aviation megacities. And it's not just touching the aviation megacities. If you look at Asia to Europe, you can see more than 100 weekly frequencies. It's really driving and picking up this growth and assisting in all of this growth that's, that's occurring in these major trunk routes. So let's spend a little time, I'd like to talk about the 380. I had a lot of questions last night about why aren't you selling 380s? If, you, if it's such a great plane, why, why aren't you selling them? What, what about the cost? And what about the 777X? Does a 777X obsolete the 380? I don't want to get into a lot of details about new aircraft developments. I like to take a, just really a simple look at the 380. The 380 was developed having growth in mind. When we launched the program, we were looking at those charts that I just showed you where traffic will double every 15 years. Traffic will grow 4.7% per year. The aircraft was designed having its capacity to capture and rationalize the growth in the future. And the aircraft does this by connecting, by boosting the connecting traffic. Because of the capacity on the aircraft, it opens up new slot availabilities to either grow traffic between two origin and destination pairs, or maybe even add a new destination between uh, 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 an airport and, and, a, and a new city. It also, because of the capacity, helps you compete against via traffic. So if you have an origin and destination, a routing with an A380 and the capacity, you can help compete against new operators who may connect those origin and destination, but via a connecting flight. The 380 is very successful. We've seen how that works today in driving back to the trunk routes. And of course, if you are operating in, 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 in your own hub, and you think about how to optimize the, the departures and the arrivals, so you, so you think about optimizing your network in the hub, the 380 makes it very easy for you because it does have that capacity. And it does this with higher yields. Um, if you look just at, uh, if we take an example of slots and scheduling, there are only so many preferred schedules per day. We all would prefer when we're traveling on a long haul flight, you want to fly overnight. You don't want to fly over day and then arrive at midnight and then have to try to adjust with jet lag, go to sleep, wake up for your meeting. You want to get on a flight at night, 
Preferably, after you've had a meeting, maybe you've had time to eat dinner, you get on your flight, you fly all night, you get a nice rest, maybe 8, 9, 10, 13 hours of rest, you wake up, have coffee, shower, go to your meeting. That's what we call a preferred slot. And those preferred slots warrant the highest yield. Passengers are willing to pay a premium for those slots. When you overlay that with where the traffic is growing, and again, I go back to the aviation megacities, where 90% of the long haul traffic is traveling by or through these aviation megacities, you can see if the capacity is there, and we will see the capacity there with 4.7% annual growth rates, you want to capture this because you can maximize your yield potential. You have the seats, so and the, and the demand is there, the, the yield is warranted. If you operate at 380, you will capture the yields. In addition, there is an A380 effect, simply because of its comfort. And we're always talking, when we talk about an A380, we're talking about three-class comfort, first-class business class and economy. So with this comfort, you do have an A380 effect, and that also warrants a, a yield premium. And when we've looked recently at, at data accumulated over the last six years of operation, we can see that when you have various routings to the same destination, so you can fly to, uh, to, uh, to Asia either through Amsterdam or through Paris from Toulouse. You have two routings to the same destination. Typically, the routing where an A380 is operating, you see higher yields. And in this case, when we looked at 2012 data and we looked at uh, over uh, 13,000 city pairs, uh, and we looked at where 10% of the traffic was on 380s, we see that the 380 yields about three cents more on its routing than on the routing that's not being operated by an A380, which makes sense because one, you probably have a preferred routing, and two, you have the 380 effect. It's very comfortable to fly on the, on the A380. So let's, let's look at some of these numbers. And before I go into these numbers, I want to remind you that the, these last six years were six years of the recession. Remember, we, we started the enter into service of this aircraft one year before the financial crisis hit. So let's put this into perspective. It's a growth aircraft that entered into service as we were entering the recession, as we were entering one of the worst financial crises in, in, in the history. So you can look through the numbers. You can see we started off with one airplane and, and we've grown to almost 100 aircraft uh, last year. But I want you to look at the, the passengers, the number of passengers. If you, if you add up the number of passengers who have taken benefit of, of flying on the 380, during the crisis, during the recession, you have about 70 million, rough, give or take, 70 million passengers. When you take the Sabre data and you look at the average fares paid by those 70 million, the A380 generated over $30 billion of revenue for its airlines, 30 billion, guess what? During a crisis, when, when airlines were taking capacity out. Very important to note, the A380 today has been operating in a recession. Now, let's look at the, where it's gonna go from here. When you look at those operators, when you look at those operators who represented those six years of data, What's interesting is, first of all, we, uh, we, we have about eight of the, the 20 top international carriers today. We would have 12 of them have ordered, so progressively we'll have more operators. But when you look at the layouts of the in-operation A380s, the average seat count is about 490 seats per A380. 490 seats. That's, that's quite comfortable for an A380. Makes sense because you're in a recession where you were having capacity reduction, you were having a concern about filling seats. That would make sense. You would have layouts that were more accommodating for, for the recession, nevertheless still generating $30 billion worth of revenue. But the A380 is designed to capture growth. The, average, the, the standard layout that we offered at entry into service was 525 seats. So when we look at the future and we look at now, we're coming at, we've had three consecutive quarters of traffic growth globally. 
I, and I think it's safe to say globally we are coming out of a recession when it comes to the air traffic industry. When we look at that chart that I showed you, 4.7% annual growth rate, traffic doubling again in 15 years. We are coming out of the recession. We are now back to where we should have been. So you think about a reset when we initially launched in the, the 380 into service. How does the 380 capture this growth? How will it ensure that its operators maximize its revenue? We do it by continuing to improve the aircraft. Tom talked yesterday about the 575 maximum takeoff weight increase. Why this? Because with 575 maximum takeoff weight, we can carry more payload, we can go further, so we, we, we connect more cities together. And this has allowed us to update our standard configuration to a little under 560 seats. <laughs> yes, it does bring us efficiency on a cost basis. And you see right there that uh, it's another 7%. I don't want to spend a lot of time looking at the, the cost of operating a 380. This was really the concern during the recession because you weren't sure about filling the seats. Because hands down, if you just forget about the number of seats and layouts, it's very complicated because you have pitch and you have step comfort and you have galleys and labs and all sorts of things. But if you just look at the available space on an A380 and you take the cost per available space, there is no competition today and tomorrow. The aircraft is capable of meeting any capacity requirement that an airline has. 568 is just the standard layout. It's a three-class layout with a business, very comfortable business, very comfortable uh, first class, and then a very comfortable economy seating at 10 abreast with, uh, with 18 and a half inch seats. So as we look going forward, we need to think we're out of the recession. The growth is there. If I'm an airline, I now change my, my, my mental view. Instead of concerns to fill seats, my concern is how do I get ahead of my competition and control capturing the growth, especially when I'm sitting in, inside of these major hub cities, inside of these mega cities. I want to be there first, and I want to ensure that I don't lose any traffic, and for sure, I don't want to lose any of the highest yield traffic. Those are the preferred spots. I don't want to lose any of that to competition. What is the solution? The solution now is the, the A380. And of course, we do all of this without sacrificing comfort. And I think that's very important because when we're talking about long haul flights, we're talking about 18 and a half inch seats in economy, three class layout. And today, and in, in the future, when you look at the, the, the development of new long haul aircraft in the competition, no one comes close to 18 and a half inch seats. That should be the standard. You can, you can hear me talk about it, or you can also listen to some of our customers. Just recently, Tim Clark was out saying the profitability is astounding. And I think if you look at the charts that I've showed you, the yields of the A380 warrants, if you operate the aircraft the way it is designed to be operated, and that is it's designed to capture growth, you will make a lot of money with the 380. And that is the message that we need to get out today. How do we get that message out? We've, we thought about what's a good way of, of, of getting this reminder out to, to, to the industry and to all audience. So we had a discussion and we said, maybe it's the right time to have a bold ad concept. I mean, and I don't think you can get any bolder than Own the Sky. And, and I had the pleasure last night of some of you really drilling me on Own the Sky, Chris. How is it that you can own the sky, but you're not selling any aircraft? Well. This is intended to remind you that now is the time, and John has said it, you don't order an A380 for delivery six years from now. You don't know what the industry situation will be six years from now. You want to order an A380 for delivery soon, two years, three years, because this is pretty predictable that we know that we will likely be in a growth mode in the next couple years, and that's when you want to capture the traffic. Ideally, 
you would be one of the 12 operators who already operate A380s and who will be picking up that growth. So with this Own the Sky ad campaign, we, we, uh, we, uh, we invite all of you to, to challenge us on it. Uh, and any of my marketing colleagues here or at the air show, if you have time, come by, talk to us. We'd like to talk to you about how we maximize revenue, how the A380 boosts network efficiency, how it rationalizes the growth, and it does all of this with the best comfort. And I think the comfort question, hands down, no one really argues with this. The 380, it's not a lone, it's not a lone ranger. It's not a sole player out there. The 380 is a team player. And it's very important because we get this question whenever we start talking about frequencies. Why, uh, why would I operate one 380 and not two triple sevens or two A350s? That's a very common question. Why, why not? Well, one, because those two aircraft are not going to maximize the revenue of the highest yield passengers. Remember what I said? You have just so many preferred slots with the demand. And if you don't capture them, they're gonna spill over to somebody else. So if you have a 380, you're going to get 40% more of that, of that high yield traffic. So number one. But number two, when you capture that traffic, you free up, you open up additional slots in your network where you can now place another long haul, very efficient aircraft. That's not focused on maybe capacity, but it's focused on efficiency because it's gonna match itself with the capacity, the lower capacity of a second frequency. And that's where the A380 plays very well in the team environment by supporting the next size down of, in this case, an A350-1000. And it's not just strategy or me talking here. You just have to look at the customers. If you look at the, the, the customers of the A350-1000, all but one, operate both A380s and A350-1000s. And oh, by the way, we hope that this is gonna grow because the 350 is is picking up momentum. And you we, you will see that it will it will stay in this ratio, that you will see 350 operators also having A380s. And most recently, we will see soon uh, British Airways uh, operating its first A380. And you also remember that uh, they made the announcement for A350-1000s. So the A380, great team player, brings the yields, rationalizes the growth, and it is the product today. It's the product for when you're out of a recession. And let's not forget the six years of operational history that we have on the 380. These are six years, five good years in the recession. Last year, I would say, we really were, were, were coming out of it, especially where the A380 was operating. So let's talk a little bit about this this long-range, long-haul, efficient aircraft, this, uh, this so-called A350 product that, uh, that um, oh, it's 380 now, the A350 that was here yesterday um, that, uh, that Didier talked about. 616 firm orders from 34 customers. Interesting to look at where those customers are placed. You remember the chart I showed you about where the growth of, around the world is? Pretty much consistent with here. Where you can see Asia Pacific has a high concentration of A350 orders. The A350 is one family against three. We thought it would be one family against two. It ends up being one family against three, and it's, and it's very efficient with that. If you look at just the top end of that, so we leave, we leave the 787 out right now, and we just look at the 777 competition, you can see that uh, of, of the top 10 operators, we have eight of the 777 operators have switched to A350s. So this is, this is a strong signal, and that's thanks to its efficiencies. If we just look at the 351,000 compared to the 777-300, like aircraft, same size, you can see 25% less fuel burn. That's because the aircraft is 20 tons lighter and carries 20 tons less fuel. So very efficient, and you see the market reacting, and you see the competition reacting. So it's been endorsed. You've seen all of this. The, uh, the, the, the customers are there. We also have another very efficient twin aisle. We call this our regional twin aisle. And uh, I want to spend some time and talk about this because this really, this aircraft is 
our competitor against the 787. We thought the 787 would make it obsolete, and, and I know that yesterday Tom Williams said, uh, oh, the 350 787 will cannibalize the A330. Uh, he allowed me to say, uh, I can correct him. Uh, he said yes, but you know, when he says yes, it might mean no. Uh, yes, even no, or maybe. Let me try to convince you today why the 330 is the natural competitor to the 787. Since the launch of the 787, the A330 family sold over 800 aircraft. That's almost as many 787s since they launched the, the program. That's an astounding number. Why is that? Is it luck of the draws? Is it, I've heard, uh, because there's no, there's no stock availability of 787s? What is it? But remember, when, when someone makes an order for an aircraft, they're not going to operate it for one year or two years. They're going to operate it for, for 10, 15 years. They build the network around it. They're going to build the support systems around it. So why, why, before I go into why, one thing, um, over the last five years, so we, we've, we've sold, sold over 800 since the launch of the 787. But just in the last five years, we've outsold the 787 five to one. We sold 80 uh, A330s last year, almost 100 the year before. And these are, these are net, so some of you, if you want to compare numbers, I've taken out uh, cancellations here, because these are what's really in the backlog. But we've outsold five to one. Why is that? Well, clearly, um, and these numbers are on a per trip basis, because both of, both of these aircraft, the 787-9 and the A330-300, they're the same, they're the same aircraft. It's, just, it's the same capacity. We're talking about 300 passengers, Pretty much, and I'll show you the same path, the same capabilities. But the 787 has newer engine technology. It burns less fuel. That's for sure. It's it's about two two decades newer than the A330. So it, it has a fuel burn advantage on a per trip basis. This is on a 2,000 mile per mile trip. So you know, we, we in the industry will throw a lot of numbers out at you, and it's very sophisticated because it's with range, it's with uh, the cost of fuel. This is, the assumptions that we use are what's really being operated. 2,000 nautical miles is really the operations of this type of aircraft. We use $3 a gallon for fuel, which is about where the fuel is. And then you, you, you have the, the payload, which is 300 seats. So, it burns less fuel. <clears throat> Both aircraft have roughly the same operator weight empty. So the aircraft weigh the same. So for navigation and landing, it's comparable. For maintenance, it's comparable. The 787 has a, a composite fuselage, which, which gives it some benefits on, on its cycles. But the 330 has very mature systems that, that on, a, on a price basis, when you have to replace it, there's, there's, plenty, of, there's plenty of suppliers, there's plenty of stocks, so there's competition on the, uh, on the maintenance side of the 330, simply because it's a, it's a very, uh, 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 very fluent aircraft uh, in the market. But then, when you look at the price, it's only natural the 787 costs more to buy than the A330. It's a newer aircraft. It has a lot of new development in, included in it. And when you translate that price into something that we can compare, take lease pricing, and this is you just go out and look at how much can I lease the 787-9 for today? How much can I lease an A330-300 for today? You see that the A330, because of its lower price, naturally has a lower lease price, lease rate. When you add all of this together and you look at it on a per trip basis, the A330-300, 6.5% cheaper to operate when you look at the total cost. We often don't talk about total cost when we're in the industry. We talk about cash operating cost. We talk about operating the aircraft. With the 330, because we're trying to compare a newer aircraft with an older aircraft, with like capabilities, we need to look at the direct operating cost. We need to look at what it really means at the end of the day for the airline. You add this efficiency with the fact that we have continued to invest in the program. And I'd like to stress, I often hear the 330 is an old airplane. It's an old airplane. It was, it was entered into service in 1994. 
but for every euro spent in launching the A330 program, we have invested in further developing it since its introduction into service in 1994. It's, all, it's again a new aircraft, and it's evident by looking at the 242-ton maximum takeoff weight, growth from 212 in, 19, in, uh, in, 2000, in 1994. You can see the capabilities. You see everything that's been included, and Tom showed a nice chart of all the systems that have been upgraded on the A330. But what does that really mean to the customer? It means, what is it capable of doing? It means that the 33300 is capable of doing almost 100% of the operations of the 787 family. So you get 6.5% lower direct operating cost, and you can do the same missions as the 787. So it's a, it's a great, it's great. And this is why we have sold over 800 since the launch of the 787. So just, 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 to, just to keep this in mind, and for all of us, because where does it really matter? It matters with us, because we are the ones who are actually flying around on these aircraft. So when we're comparing the A330 with the 787, we're comparing an A to breast in the A330, an A to breast, you can see it here, an A to breast aircraft, oh, let me go here, an A to breast aircraft with 18 inch wide seats, with a 17.2 inch wide 9 abreast 787. We could compare it to equivalent comfort if you'd like, because the 787 was initially designed as an 8 abreast aircraft, we all remember, with over 18 inch seats, and it would have provided a take up more comfort because the fuselage is a bit wider than the A330. But then it loses the capacity. And when it loses the capacity, it's no longer competitive with the 330 because it won't be able to carry 300 passengers. For the 77 to carry 300 passengers, it needs to go to nine abreast and degrade the level of comfort. So yes, you can get equivalent to 6% better uh, uh, cost on uh, operating the 330, but you'll get more comfort. And that's really important to take away. So finally, our, our bread and butter, the, the A320 program. Um, I don't know, it's, we've talked quite a bit about it. Uh, Tom was talking about it, House was here talking about it, Fabrice had talked about it. So let me just spend really just a couple of charts on this and then, and then we'll, we'll turn the floor over to you guys. 9,500 firm orders, um, 5,600 uh, deliveries, and a strong order backlog of almost 4,000. So a great, great, uh, great program. Um, Sharplets are just confirming the strategy. You all, you all remember we had a, a single out strategy where we start with the Sharplets and then we go to Neo. The Sharplets performance where we have beaten our estimates of fuel burn. So we're at about 4% fuel burn improvement, we're at over 3.5%. On time, with already 62 of these delivered to 22 operators. We are, we are well on our path towards NEO. And this, this confirms, and I don't want to say any more about it, because Klaus, I think, really convinced you that the program is on track. We will have NEOs out there, and, and it is a successful program. It, is, it has broken industry records on, on the speed of the order capturing, and uh, we're just really proud of the, of the uh, A320 family. This is a John slide, you know, he likes those 60, 60, 40. That's what he plans to do in the future. But we can't stop there. We have worked on the cost side of the NEO with 15% fuel burn improvement. But what about the revenue side? You know, I talked about revenue with A380. Revenue is also very key, especially when you see upgaging. On the revenue side, we continue to innovate by, in, innovate by adding space flex which is 16 more seats. 16 more seats, I think I had, there was a question yesterday, what is the pitch? It's 28 inch pitch, but one thing to take into consideration is it's with slim, with our slim line seats. And when you equivalent slim line seats with the seats today, and you look at our 220 class configuration, that gives you the equivalent of two inches more. So it is the equivalent of 30 inch pitch. Um, and, and with that, uh, you get uh, 236 uh, in it, and this is really a configuration for the low-cost carriers. And of course, with 30-inch pitch, 
uncomparable six abreast comfort with uh, with uh, you can see this uh, 18, 18 inch 18 inch wide seats and, and that's that's one that's really one message uh, if I go backwards here one message I do want to get across uh, it is it is on that comfort so 2013 in perspective we believe we're we're well out of the recession our focus needs to be on growth our focus needs to be finding the right solutions for our customers to capture the growth. Will we believe we have the right products for that? Do our products adapt to the market? Do you, you have the ability to go long range, short range? Do you have the ability to have 40% more capacity, lower capacity? We're adapting to the markets. We allow you to maximize your revenue, capturing, rationalizing the growth, but capturing the highest yields. And we do all of this with the best comfort. And for Airbus, the standard of comfort is 18 inches. And let's, and, and I rem rem remember this, the standard of comfort is 18 inches. Don't let anybody tell you that the standard of comfort is 17.2 inches. I don't want that to be the standard of comfort. So please challenge them because we share the market so the likelihood of all of us flying on an Airbus or a competitor is probably 50-50, and I would like to have that equivalent comfort. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for this excellent presentation. And by the way, this presentation will be made available at 11. We will have the prints out on the front desk. Also, in his presentation, you have seen uh, the new May orders and delivery figures which uh, will be distributed to you today at 6 to meet uh, with, the, um, with the embargo deadline and then after that to all the other outside world users who have a little advantage here to shoot them out earlier. Um, Chris, thanks for this presentation. Let's start now right away with the Q&A. And we have uh, the guy next to Andrea Mossman. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jeremy, not this guy, but thank you. Anyway. <laughs> and I'm from uh, Asian Airlines and Airports magazine. Chris, you gave us a very convincing uh, rundown demonstration about the A380, the A320, and the A350. Um, but there's no doubt the A380 is not selling as rapidly as you would, uh, you would require, or at least I'm sure that you would want airlines to buy. Will we ever see a situation where you will kind of take Boeing on, on their own turf with the hub and spoke design and say, buy an A380, get an A323. So I kind of buy one, get one free. <laughs> that wouldn't be, that would be uh, my decision. I don't think we need to do that. Um, first of all, the, the, airlines, the airlines see where the growth is coming from. And those, that connecting traffic is generating a lot of profit. And one thing I didn't, uh, I didn't mention is, is the 380 helps to boost the yields on the connecting traffic. Because of the, the way it optimizes the, the trunk routes, you, you get higher yields on the connecting traffic. And we've seen that uh, 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 in, in specific examples where you can have up to a couple of cents higher yield simply because you're feeding into one of the most preferred slots that are operated by an A380. Next question, goes, no. next question goes to Tim from Reuters. Hi, uh, Tim from Reuters. Thank you, Chris. Uh, on the A330, um, the, the small print at the bottom of your graph referred to the lease rates for 7878, 1.3 million. But your comparison was with the 7879. I just wanted to double check which aircraft you're talking about. And also, looking at those numbers, they're based on a $95,000 lease rate for the A330. If you assume a roughly 1% lease rate, that means you're selling A330s for less than $100 million, which is a 60% discount. So this formula only works if you sell the aircraft very cheaply towards the end of their product life. How long can you keep that up against the 787, which is a modern aircraft with um, a whole life ahead of it. 
And just final question, did I hear you correctly say that the A330 is more comfortable than the 787? A wider fuselage, more modern paint. If so, tell us a bit more about why you think that. Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, it, we're comparing to the Dash 9, so I'll, I'll have to double check uh, all the figures there. The lease rates, um, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of factors in the lease rate. One, we are not selling A330s at a loss. I, I'm not here to, 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 to confirm that the, the 330s are being sold at a loss. In fact, they're quite profitable for us. Um, but it doesn't have the newness factor. And when you look at a lease rate, there are other elements in it. It is list price. So rather than look at where the 330 pricing is, look at where the 787 pricing has to be. The 787 is not going to be priced at the level of an A330. It is, it is much newer. The development cost, you all know it. Just go ask, how much did it cost to develop the 787? I don't know the figures off my head, but it's probably 2x of what it costs to develop an A330. So you have to look at all of this in the lease rate. Uh, your question was on, on comfort. Uh, so when you look at comfort, we're comparing an A330 with eight abreast, 18 inch seats, and we measure, it's also important, we measure between the armrests. Because that's what we consider to be the, 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 the real space. When you have an armrest down, it's the space between the armrests, not the size of the cushion. The size of the cushion, you lose part of the size of the cushion under the armrest. So you, you compare an eight abreast, 18 inch, with a nine abreast, 17.2 inch seat in the 787. So that's the equivalent comfort. And then you also get how many, you know, how, how are the seat configurations? You have 242. Uh, it's quite comfortable. People like to have uh, sitting in a in, in a in a in a in a in a in a twin rather than uh, than getting into a, a triplet. Next question goes to FT. Hi, Chris. Um, you've given a sort of very bullish outlook um, for the economy. I just wondered if we could get your view on whether you think the growth in deliveries seen in recent years is sustainable, or whether production rates will have to come down in the medium term. And I'm saying that because it feels like. Um, these rates have been predicated on an unusual divergence between interest rates, which are record lows, and uh, price of oil, which is at still relative highs. If either of those factors change, does it not imply that um, production rates are going to have to come down in the medium term? No. Uh, your, your question is, is, is there a bubble there? And uh, I think when you, when you look at uh, the growth, uh, you, you see the airlines, uh, th th they see it as well. Uh, there is a uh, uh, the propensity to travel is increasing. That means people are wanting to take advantage of their travel. It's being driven by how uh, low-cost airlines, how uh, the regional airlines are stimulating the demand with fares. Um, in some areas, there's a lot of competition, and when you see this competition, you could say, ah, there's a lot of competition. They're over-ordering. Well, what does that competition actually do? It drives fares down. And when you drive the fares down. You stimulate the traffic demand. You make it affordable for people who would otherwise take a train to take an airplane. And when you capture them and they're on an airplane, I know if, if I can travel two hours by plane rather than 12 hours by train, and it's in my affordable category, I'm going to always fly. So you have this effect. So no, we don't, we don't see a bubble there. Uh, if anything, in certain categories of aircraft, we need to look at how we can we can review our production rates to, to meet the growing demand. So we're probably a little little constrained right now on meeting some of the demand that's out there, especially for the the wide body uh, efficient uh, uh, twins. Next question goes to Andrea Rossman. Nope. The lady next to Jeremy. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Could I ask your thoughts about this uh, scratch of the A380? Tom yesterday said it's something we could should consider, but it seemed like he was kind of backing away from it. And I had always assumed that one of these days we would see a stretch. Um, you all, he also mentioned that you're looking at other possibilities, maybe more high-capacity configurations for the plane. Could you talk about that? Absolutely. Thank you. 
Um, first of all, I just I, I showed you our new layout to 560 seats. Is this working? Okay. I showed you our new layout with up to 560 seats. The average in operation is 490. Clearly, looking at a stretch of the 380 is in the realm of the possibility. But before we get there, we need to see the airlines start to fully utilize the, cap the capacity of the existing A380. This is really important. When we see that the trend is moving towards 560, then we start to say, okay, when do we look at the next evolution of the product? But today, I think it's too premature because you only have a few customers who really are, are fully taking advantage of the capacity of the 380. And, and it's not enough to warrant the entire development of a new, of a, of a new program with everything that we have going on today. So, um, so it is something that is in the realm of the possibility. But let's see first the airlines start to operate the A380 as it was designed. Fill, getting 568 seats, you know you'll get the passengers because the, 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 the existing 380s are already at above 80% load factor, but 490 seats. Let's get the 80% load factor on the 560 seats, and then we'll take a look at, at the next. There, there are a lot of uh, improvements. We're always looking at improvements on the 380, system improvements. As you know, we, we, we like to, to test technologies on aircraft. So the 350, we've run a lot of systems tests through the A380. And, and as it goes and matures on the 350, it comes back onto the 380. Because we know it, it's capable, we just need the technology to be matured and and tested in service with the 350, so that you can see a laundry list of technologies that will come back into the A380. Um, we also need to look into the cabin, because we spent a lot of time on the aircraft. And it's not just the aircraft, because this aircraft has such a lot of cabin space. As I said, it's, it's un, uncomparable in cabin space. Think about the weight improvements that we can get, the efficiencies that we can get in the cabin also helping us to industrialize the, the, the customization of a cabin. Those are really critical items for the 380, which is weighing us down today, because it does take us a while. And if we want to tap into the, 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 the next realm of demand, which is probably going to be also uh, airlines with a smaller demand, they may want three A380s. But for three A380s, are you going to pay for the entire development of a cabin just for three? You, you, you want to have a lower cost configuration, but you also want to maintain your, what they call, airline design language. You want to be differentiating somehow from the rest of the competition. So, so we look at ways of innovating in, in how we develop and meet the, the cabin needs for, for the future customers. Next question goes to the next chair. Hello. Hello, David. David Lynn from Australian Business Travel. I have two questions about seat width and comfort. I'll let you answer the first before I ask the second. The first question is, what has been the, the industry's reaction to the extra wide 20-inch economy seat? It, it, when they... And I think I have to stand over here. When they, uh, when they see it, it's fabulous. Because it's a contrast to see a 20-inch seat in a single aisle. And they love it. The, the issue today is how do you gain revenues from it? There are only a few airlines in the world who really have mastered ancillary revenues. Uh, you know them, you've, you've flown on some of them. Uh, low cost carriers, low fare, but then by the time you land, you have, you have emptied your wallet on sandwiches and coats and headphones and videos and everything like that. So how, how do you, how do you uh, uh, charge for a 20 inch seat? That's really the question because they want to be able to value value that 20 inch seat. We're still premature on that. As we evolve, the 20 inch seat is an option. We know we can do it, that's the good news. And we do it without sacrificing the industry level comfort that's out there. Um, and, and we might meet uh, a demand that's, that's, that's burgeoning, uh, requiring, you can imagine, it, it could be premium seating the whole length of the aircraft on either side of the aisle. It's just a matter of how can we charge for it. So no one's it yet. No one has taken order of the 20-inch. My second question then is, you've talked about the standard of comfort with Airbus being 18 inches, it's not Boeing 17 for two inches seat. Given that the 20-inch wide seat shrinks the adjacent seats to 17 inches each, isn't it hypocritical for Airbus to then put 17-inch seats on the menu? That's why I said 
doesn't it compromise comfort? This is why I said 20 inch takes you to this industry standard because the 737 isn't at 18 inches either. So you could get 20 inch seats and then you have this thing. So let's take an example. If you're already a 737 operator and you want to change to an A320 uh, aircraft, but you're operating a mixed fleet, you don't want to differentiate two. You don't want to go from having all 17 plus to now 18 inch seats and you have a clear differentiator. You can maintain that 17 inch, but then you have a type of premium seating, kind of a business class, but the whole length of the aircraft with your 20 inch seat. This is the dilemma that you have. This is what we need to figure out. How do you find value for something like that? Otherwise, it's just easier to say the A320 family is an 18 inch seat family, and that's, that's what it's designed for. Uh, sorry, we need also to give other journalists the opportunity. Ben from Australia. Uh, Chris, um, I didn't have time to check your, uh, your opening graphic about the frequency of uh, A380 flights from Australia, but I think you actually underestimated it considerably. If I look at the uh, northern timetabling season when it begins, um, it's about 50% more because uh, uh, Emirates is you know, adding extra frequencies, converting its uh, 777s to A380s uh, in Sydney, uh, adding another one in Melbourne, uh, Singapore Airlines is adding another one in both cities, and they're flying them across to Tasman. Uh, so that's the good news. The, the more difficult question seems to be that if we migrate to 11 address high density seating, uh, in the A380, as we did with the 747. I remember the glory days of 9 abreast, and I remember the horror of 10 abreast uh, when it came in, which is a great story at that time. That product is actually not going to be as comfortable anymore as your 9 abreast seating in the, in the A350. So we will see, um, we will see your 350 product, uh, particularly the higher capacity 1000, uh, in a peculiar sort of way, uh, pulling pulling uh, the, uh, the passenger accolade, if you like, away from the A380. Is this a really a problem for Airbus? Uh, is it purely a problem for the consumer media? Um, and does it really count when an airline makes its, uh, makes its orders? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I should spend a couple minutes to talk about 11 abreast on the A380. Um, contrast this with where we are today with total seat counts with the 380, 409 seats. So airlines today are not utilizing the full capacity of the 380. We need to remember that. The standard layout is 568 at 10 abreast, 558, 560 at 10 abreast with the 18 and a half inch comfort seats. Going to 11 abreast is not the first decision step you would make as for any airline. The first decision step you're going to make is do I, how do I optimize my business class, my first class? How can I maybe move the premium seating from the main deck to the upper deck? Because the upper deck is narrower and I get more economy seats on the main deck. So there are other, other uh, decisions that an airline will make first to get more seats, okay? By the time you get to an 11 abreast, you've already maximized the, 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 the you've, you've found the optimum level of comfort and capacity and you have no, nowhere else to go. So then you look at, can I go one or one abreast? It's not for all the markets. First of all, it's, 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 it's for uh, short haul, because you're not going to fly a long haul in an 11 abreast. It's for short haul trunk routes, uh, where, where, you, where you can imagine this type of capacity that's there. It's not many airlines that, uh, uh, that, that will go for it, especially today. You will see them first gauging up from 490 seats to the 560 seats, and you can even go beyond 560 if you saw the layout, that's 560 in a three-class configuration. Take away the bit to the first class, keep a business class, do a two-class layout, and you get another, I don't know, uh, the experts are here, another five rows, thank you very much. So so you can see that that, that there, there are a lot of uh, opportunities before you get to 11 press. But the 11 press, is not for the long haul flight. The 11 press is, is, is designed to, for those who need that high ultra, ultra dense capacity and it's, it's for shorter haul flights. Next question goes to India. Hi, Saurabh from Times of India, Delhi. 
What is Airbus' reaction to India not allowing airlines to fly the A380 to India? Lufthansa, Singapore Airlines and the Emirates have been very keen to fly the A380 to India but they are not allowed. And my second question is, are the five A380s ordered by Kingfisher still on your order books? The first question. Um, first question is, our view is, it's unfortunate for the Indian economy. Uh, there are plenty of studies that have been done factoring and estimating the economic impact that an A380 brings to the airport and to the region. Having an A380 in, in a particular airport stimulates a lot of ancillary business, catering, uh, the, 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 the support side. Uh, it brings the traffic into the airport because, it, again, everything that I said, boosting the connectivity, rationalizing the growth. And there it is quantified. Uh, and, uh, and we can get you the numbers. Uh, there has been some numbers uh, uh, done in, in Dubai, as an example, in Singapore, on the effect that the 380 brought to the region. Um, it would be perfect for the Indian market, and, and the airlines want to want to fly into India. I think it's just a matter of time when uh, when uh, when the uh, when the environment changes and, uh, and starts to allow A380s uh, uh, into uh, into India. Uh, the, the Kingfisher question, uh, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer myself. They're in the books. They're in the books, says so Stefan. Hello. Um, hello, Bruno Trevedic, uh, Les Echo. Um, even if the air 330 is uh, still doing well, uh, if we compare a Boeing product line on long haul and yours, you have three new models and so we have six. Uh, don't you think that in 10 years you will have a big gap between uh, uh, for uh, all what is under 300 seats and what is on between 350 seats and for uh, 500 uh, if we see that you don't have anything between uh, the longest version of the S350 and the uh, S380. <laughs> When we look below the 300 seat, okay, so on the up gauging, we know what's happening there. And we've talked about uh, that we need to look at the 351,000 production rates. That is for sure. We need to catch up on the on the 300 plus. Not forgetting that we have the 380. And the 380 is at the top end. So there is no boxing us uh, un until you get an aircraft bigger than, than the 380. So on the, on, the, on, the, on the plus 300, we have to look at the production rates of 351,000. On the minus 300, between the 330 and the success that we have with the 330, and the, the 350 family, because the 350-900 also it is, is a great competitor, we didn't talk about this, with the 787-10, um, and it will hold its own with, with this aircraft. We will, you can share the production rates, they start to blend between a 330 and the 350, and that's kind of what, what Tom had on his chart, and that's what I read as complementary. The two products are complementary in helping to to address this 300 seat uh, segment. Thank you, Chris. With view of the time, I have unfortunately to close this session. You are invited to approach Chris afterwards. He 